Hello, I'm Jose Martinez. New Yorkers will be voting in the general election on Tuesday, November 6. They will cast their ballots for state and local offices, including governor, lieutenant governor, attorney general, comptroller, state assembly, and state senate. The winners of these races will take office in January 2019. Today, we are bringing you interviews with three candidates. We'll talk to assembly member Linda Rosenthal, who represents a District 67, which covers parts of the Upper West Side and Hell's Kitchen. She's running unopposed in this election. Then, we'll talk to State Senator Jose Serrano, who represents a District 29 that covers parts of the Bronx and Spanish Harlem and the Upper East and West Side. But my first interview is with Robert Jackson. Mr. Jackson is a Democratic candidate running for State Senate in New York's 31st District. The 31st District covers Upper Manhattan, including portions of Hamilton Heights, Harlem, and Wood and Washington Heights. Mr. Jackson's opponent, Republican Melinda Crump, declined our invitation to debate. In some respects, this district represents everything that is New York. It feels like a neighborhood. It feels like what New York uh, would feel like to someone who's coming here for the first time. So big stores, small stores, and people always on the move. This district is actually flanked by multiple bridges. And I think that's um, a symbol of what this district represents, that we have people who come in and settle here um, and make their mark here and make this district not only unique, but also very welcoming. New York City is New York City, and this neighborhood is a lot more divided uh, than people think. And despite it being the Upper West Side and a bastion of sort of liberalism and a place where equality really matters, um, there's a lot of inequality right here, block by block, in this neighborhood. The main issue that we're faced uh, is affordable housing. It's the ability for residents, for neighbors, to be able to afford to live in the district. You'll find folks who have been living here for 25 quarter of a century. 30 years, uh, who've always found it to be a working class community, and, and the rents reflect it. So now, salaries have not kept up, but the rent has gone up. New York City is New York City because of its small businesses. The flavor, the character that you feel when you're walking down the street is not when it's lined with Chase's and Citibanks. It's when the streets are lined by small businesses. When I walk around this district and I see empty storefronts, I think this is a loss. What can be done to keep folks in their apartment? Second question, what can we do to increase the stock to get folks into those apartments? I want to see a percent for parks. I want to see a percent for art. People think of parks and of art as some kind of fluffy extra, but it's not. I think it's important to listen to the small business owners, have them craft um, solutions, ideas on how they can be supported, how they can still keep their businesses going, and then develop programs out of that. Jackson, thank you for being here. I want to start this conversation talking about your accomplishments. I think this is this is what we need to know, and I think our uh, viewers want want to know. Uh, you served in the New York City Council for 11 years. And 12 years. 12 years. What were three of your proudest accomplishments? Well, I, I think uh, co-chairing the Black, Latino, and Asian Caucus and being involved in certain litigation to talk about equality. So. Uh, with the stop, question, and frisk uh, situation, uh, the caucus filed a brief on behalf of 
all of the 27 members of the Black, Latino, and Asian Caucus, uh, which resulted in, overall, a reduction in crime, uh, less people being stopped and thrown up against the wall um, and with no reason whatsoever. And that was very important overall from a broader perspective. And then another uh, litigation uh, with the Black, Latino, and Asian Caucus, the Vulcan Society filed a lawsuit against FDNY uh, because they felt that it was being discriminatory against people of color. Uh, so uh, the caucus filed a brief in that, uh, obviously through uh, free pro bono legal work. Uh, and as a result of that, uh, the FDNY is becoming more diverse overall in the city of New York. So that's one thing. And then in the city council, uh, the finality of the campaign for fiscal equity lawsuit, even though that lawsuit started before I was in the city council, started in May of 1993, but it ended with the highest court uh, in 2006. And as you know, the end result was about $16 billion for the children of New York City, about $11 billion for capital to build new buildings and make major repairs, and about $5.5 billion in expense money to hire teachers and uh, guidance counselors and school aides uh, and those type of things. So those were big, big, big accomplishments. And also, you know, I try to put forward the Small Business Survival Bill to help small businesses survive in New York City. And when you talk to everyone, no matter who you talk to, the mayor and everyone else, they say that small businesses are the backbone of New York City. Uh, I tried to put forward the Small Business Survival Bill. It was, did not pass while I was in office, but it may be passed pretty soon as a result of Edonis Rodriguez carrying that, will, that bill now in the city council. Those are a couple of things uh, overall, but those are just few that I, I think are very, very important. Right, and, and I think you just brought a, a great topic then, and I, and I would like to get a, a little bit, you know, in depth with this. It's like, what issues in your <clears throat> district uh, do you think need more funding? So, when you look at the district overall, uh, the 31st senatorial district, which includes Marble Hill, Inwood, Washington Heights, comes down into Hamilton Heights, Upper West Side, uh, snakes down into Midtown, and wounds up in the Chelsea housing on 26th Street and 9th Avenue, obviously people have heard about overall NYCHA and the needs for NYCHA and all of the negative stuff that has occurred. Uh, so there's about a, over half a million New Yorkers that are um, tenants of NYCHA. And so in my district, uh, we have uh, Marble Hill Houses, Dykeman Houses, Audubon House, 99 Fort Washington, Elliott House, uh, Amsterdam houses, and all of these are NYCHA developments, and so they need help, obviously, in order to deal with all of the repairs. Uh, someone's put in a ticket, and that ticket is not filled for uh, such a long period of time. Some people say uh, for six months, a year, to, to, to make a repair that should, in my opinion, take no, no more than a week. So that's one issue. Obviously, the MTA situation overall, everyone is complaining about uh, how, you know, the delays in, uh, in the MTA system and, and it's hurting New York, hurting them as far as getting to work, taking their kids to school, hurting the New York economy. That's a major issue, which is uh, not only a state issue, not only a city issue, but it's a federal issue. So the MTA is a big issue. But obviously, in the 31st Senatorial District, uh, has the most rent-stabilized units in the city of New York. And in fact, looking at the statistics, it's my understanding that 77,000 uh, units of rent-stabilized apartments are in the, 50, in the 31st Senatorial District, the largest in New York City. And the negative impact that's having overall, because about one-third of those individuals are preferential rent, where uh, the rents may be at this level, uh, let's say at $2,400 a month, but the landlord will rent it to someone for $1,900. Uh, and they say, oh, as a family said, we can afford that. But then when that lease is up, the landlord says, okay, now I'm going to increase your rent from $1,900 and $250 or $300 more. And you say, wait a minute, I can't, I can't afford that. And so as a result of that, what happens is they move out. And when they move out, landlords get a vacancy bonus of 20%. Uh, including then whatever the normal rent stabilization increases are. And so what that does is accelerate uh, so that 
uh, the rent will be at the highest level, according to the state law, of around $2,750, and then it becomes decontrolled, and the landlord can charge whatever they want. And so as a result of that, when you look at the homeless population in the city of New York, it's growing more and more and more. Uh, people are struggling to get by. Uh, and so jobs and opportunity, uh, affordable housing, uh, education, health care are some of the major issues that impact the, the 31st Senatorial District. And, and, and health, I think, it's, it's a very important topic for uh, our community. And you are a strong advocate for uh, the, New, the New York uh, health, uh, health Act, Act right? Without and uh, why do you support this bill and, and why, that, why would that mean to our community? Well, I support the bill because everyone, we live uh, in the greatest country in the world. Uh, and so as a result of that, health care should not be for the privileged or for the wealthy. Health care should be for all. Uh, and the, the healthier our city, the healthier our country is as far as physical and mental health, then the better off we will be overall as a city, state, and country. Uh, and so affording uh, comprehensive health coverage for everyone is extremely important for me as an individual, as someone that grew up very poor, uh, where, you know, um, we didn't have the best dental health or, or the best medical health overall uh, and growing up in my family. And so now, as an adult, sometimes you pay the price of stuff that you don't take care of when you're young. But obviously, when you're a young child, you depend on your parents to do that overall for you. But health insurance, uh, comprehensive health coverage is extremely important for everyone in New York City and New York State. And I hope that the New York State Senate uh, and the governor will agree to that. And some people say, wait a minute, this is going to cost so much money. But can you imagine how much it would cost uh, if you have to be hospitalized for something that may be minor and you wait until it becomes critical and you go to the emergency room? Who's paying for that? So let's talk about comprehensive health coverage and let's find a pathway to get there for everyone. And that's also related to the vote. People need to go out and, and vote. And, and I would like to bring this topic about the election reform. Do you support it? What, what do you think this could be for, for our community? Well, election reform is happening. Whether uh, you or other individuals do not think it's happening, all you have to do is read the papers, listen to the news, uh, and, and just go out there. Uh, it's like, for example, this morning, I was at a 79th Street and, and Broadway, the number one line, uh, basically asking people to get involved, help Democrats to flip uh, some seats in the New York State Senate. And why am I asking them to do that? Uh, because right now, from my perspective, and these are my words and my terminologies, that the Republicans control the New York State Senate. And when you look at the New York Health Care Act, uh, that, uh, that is being sponsored by Dick Gottfried, who is a state assembly member from the Chelsea area. The New York State Assembly, which is led by the Democrats, they have passed that bill uh, year after year, uh, but have not been passed by the New York State Senate. And so as a result of that, the New York Health Care Act has not been uh, voted on and signed into law. Other examples of that is the uh, Reproductive Health Act. And right now, the federal standard as far as Roe versus Wade, everybody's been hearing about that. Well, the New York state law is less than that. So if, for example, if you are a woman and you're in late stages of pregnancy and you needed to have an abortion, uh, you could not do that in New York state. It would be illegal for you to do that. And so with the women advocates and everyone else who believes in a woman's right to determine their own destiny in their own body, uh, we are trying to codify Roe versus Wade to be the New York State standard, and right now it's not. So the federal standard is here where I'm pointing at, and the New York State standard is down here. We're trying to get it up to the same level. And so that, in my opinion, would be a very easy thing to pass once, in my opinion, the Democrats lead uh, the New York State Senate. So you're ready, to, you're ready to keep fighting for that? I'm ready to vote yes on the Reproductive Health Care Act.
And so how about the environment? You know, your district is right along uh, Hudson River, and uh, which is very nice. But what would you do to protect the environment? <clears throat> well, protecting the environment is very important. In fact, um, I remember asking not too long ago an environmentalist, so what are the two major issues in the environment? And what he, his response to me was, air and water. <laughs> You have to have healthy air to breathe in order to live and survive. And, you know, in New York City, there's uh, uh, sometimes the pollution, obviously. Uh, and I, I remember back when I was growing up uh, in the late 50s, early 60s, where uh, uh, in buildings, they used to burn the rubbers in the compactor rooms. And so you used to see the heavy, thick smoke coming out of, of the buildings. And now, obviously, you don't burn trash in buildings anymore. Everything is either hauled off to the landfill or recycled, okay? So, and then in New York City, uh, in the city council, as you know, we passed a law basically saying eliminating number six fuel oil, uh, and, and now owners of buildings have to use number four or number two, basically uh, less pollution in the air, uh, because most of the pollution you would think comes from cars, but it comes from buildings. Uh, but so, and obviously with water, we have to protect our water sources in order to drink healthy water. And I've said, if you go to Florida, the water is very, very iron and rusty, you know, in different other places. New York City has some of the best water in the world. In fact, I hope that I'm drinking it now. Well, I'm gonna have some water too. I think this is New York City water it, and not bottled is. water. <laughs> it is New York City water. But the environment is so important for us in generations to come, so we have to look after that. And so, you know, coming from the environment, now, now when we walk the streets in Manhattan, we see a lot of empty stores. Mm. What's happening with those stores? There's empty space there. Uh, how would you uh, think we can attract people to go to these stores? You, uh, well, I wish that I had a magic wand and I would wave that wand like this, and then all of these little small stores would be mom and pop stores uh, that are thriving uh, in business. Uh, obviously, one of the problems is, it's the same problem that we hear with uh, the rental housing. The rent is too damn high. Uh, and let me, because you know, there was a candidate that used that terminology, and I don't know if he put a patent on that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you remember he ran for mayor a couple of cycles ago, and that was all he said, was the rent is too damn high. And in fact, I was at uh, my Democratic club, had our meeting uh, last night up in Inwood, uh, and we ordered four pizzas uh, from a local small pizza shop uh, on Broadway right near Dykeman Street. And you know what they were complaining about? Uh, that uh, the rent is so high, along with the real estate taxes uh, and regular taxes that they have to pay, and that they, they can't really even get out of their lease. They want to basically leave or try to sell the business, but uh, they're locked into a lease right now and they can't get out. And they have been in business for decades and really they're ready to retire because the health of one of the owners is not very good. And so, but if they just shut down, they're still obligated to that lease and they still have to then possibly pay off that lease or face litigation from the landlord. But people are complaining about the fact that the leases are too high when they renew, and then landlords are passing along the real estate taxes to them. And so, in essence, that's what you hear all over the place. And, and that even on 181st Street, where I live near 181st Street, near Broadway, there are empty stores right there on 181st Street between Broadway and Fort Washington Avenue. And I can point to three or four stores that are empty right now with signs up in their window. So there are not only empty stores, there's also a lot of people that are uh, moving out of Manhattan because they can't afford to live in, in these buildings. Um, and specifically old people that uh, are part of New York City history. Uh, what would you do to, to work with seniors in, in New York City? Well, you know, I've gone to many of the Democratic clubs, um, not necessarily the Republican clubs because they're I don't even know where a Republican club is in our district, let me be quite frank, uh, where there are 16 Democratic clubs in the 31st Senatorial District. 
And in going to some of the district, uh, Democratic clubs on Upper West Side, I, I look at the people around. I look at what's the average age of the person at a Democratic club. I've heard some of these uh, members of Democratic clubs talk about that, you know, that their rent control. And as you know, the difference in rent control and rent stabilization is rent stabilization is controlled by the Rent Guidelines Board in New York City. Rent control tenants are governed by the state legislature. And uh, as you know, under Mayor de Blasio, uh, for the past two cycles, I believe there used to be first time ever in the history of the Rent Guidelines Board, a 0% increase for the first year and uh, then uh, maybe a 2% for the second year. Uh, but right now, uh, the rent control uh, laws in New York State, uh, the rent increases is 7.5% every single year. And people are complaining about that because those seniors that you're talking about who have lived in their apartments prior to, I think, some part of 1971, they're rent controlled. They don't have a lease, uh, but their rent goes up. And they're on fixed income, quite frankly, uh, they can't afford it, and so they're trying to do everything they can to stay in the units that they've been in for decades and be able to afford to eat and survive. So that, in my opinion, we're attempting to correct uh, when we get up to Albany. But you know one thing? We're going to have a fight. You know why? Because REBNY, REBNY is the acronym from the rent uh, estate, or the, the real estate uh, industry in New York City, they pump millions of dollars uh, to the Republicans in upstate New York so that they will maintain basically uh, the leadership control of the New York State Senate that will look after their interests. My interest is not for the real estate industry. My interest is for the people that I represent. And most of them, as I indicated, in the 31st Senatorial District, we have the most rent stabilized in the city of New York, over 77,000. And all of those individuals that are not rent stabilized, that are rent controlled, that they are struggling to survive based on their pension or social security or whatever savings they have. So that's what has to happen. And I hope and expect that that will happen next year in the New York State Legislature. So uh, my last question, that that's one, that's one of the fights that you, you'll have there, but <laughs> you have another fight already uh, ongoing. It's with, uh, with the Senate to uh, try to get something for the LGBTQ community. Um, you've talked about it in the past. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about what legislation would you uh, put in place to well, help LGBTQ community? Well, there, there's been bills already out there, like gender, uh, dealing with uh, someone's identity and what have you. And so I just think that we need, when I get up there, I'm gonna take a look at that even beforehand and, and gonna obviously consult with the leadership of the New York State Senate uh, obviously, bills have already been passed, many of them, in the New York State Assembly. So it's up to us, once we become in the leadership of the New York State Senate, to move these pieces of legislation that affect LGBTQ individuals, that affect uh, everyone. It doesn't matter who you are. When you talk about the DREAM Act, uh, obviously, when I, you know what the DREAM Act is, but for your listeners, people that have come here when they were young and they're not citizens, they graduate from high school, they want to further their, go to higher education, but they cannot get tuition assistance grants from the state of New York because they're not citizens. And the state legislature, the assembly passed it, but the New York State Senate has not passed that. And as a result of that, some of them cannot further their education so they can get good jobs to support themselves and their families. And then when you talk about the, uh, uh, you talk about the, um, the Liberty Act, People said, what is the Liberty Act? And I don't assume that everyone know that, and that is to make New York State a sanctuary state. We have in the harbor of New York uh, Harbor, the Statue of Liberty. Bring me your poor and ragged so we, we can all look after each other. The New York State Constitution, I'm sure that you know this, but I don't know if you're, the viewers watching Manhattan Neighborhood Network TV is that uh, the state constitution, New York State Constitution says we shall take care of our poor. It says that every child deserves uh, uh, an adequate education. And the highest court has ruled in this decision in the campaign for fiscal equity lawsuit that I was involved with, 
Uh, that means graduating from high school, knowing how to read, knowing how to write, knowing how to serve on a jury, and being able to hold competitive employment. That's guaranteed in the New York State Constitution. So all of this, along with, for example, I said Gender Liberty Act, the rent laws, uh, the New York Health Care Act, uh, the R R Reproductive Health Care Act, environmental bills, all of these have not been passed by the state Senate because John Flanagan, who is the majority leader of the New York State Senate, has not allowed these things to come up for a vote. One, one vote did come up. It's not because Flanagan wanted it. It was because on uh, the money for our schools, New York State owes New York State children all around the state over $4 billion. The State Assembly said, we will pass this over a two-year period of time so that all of the schools will have the money that they need. In the 31st Senatorial District, which I'm running as the Democratic nominee, uh, $52 million a year the schools are missing. And so as a result of that, uh, go back to the bill, there was a small education bill uh, in the State Senate. Kevin Parker, State Senator from Brooklyn, tried to tag on the $4 billion owed to our students. And as a result of that, the former IDC, which is no longer in place, six out of eight of them lost. Uh, let's talk real. And as a result of that, uh, they walked off the floor instead of voting yes for our children because they had an agreement with the Republicans. So I say to you that these are facts that people don't know, and they should know the reality that exists in our city today. Mr. Jackson, so many topics we could talk here. We are out of time, but what? thank you very much. We're out of time already? We are out of time already, I'm but ready thank to you talk very some much. More. And, but we have to do it again. This is a great conversation. Thank you very much. Well, I'd like to do that when I come back, maybe uh, three months when I end the state senate. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. It has Central Park, it has Lincoln Center, it has that sort of area of very high priced real estate. People oftentimes forget that there are several housing projects that line Amsterdam Avenue that also encompass the district. New York City is New York City and this neighborhood is a lot more divided uh, than people think. And despite it being the Upper West Side and a bastion of sort of liberalism and a place where equality really matters, um, there's a lot of inequality right here, block by block in this neighborhood. It's becoming increasingly white, young, family um, affluent. There are fewer senior citizens, uh, fewer people of color, uh, fewer single people. Transportation is certainly something people were very blessed to have a, a great mass transit system on the west side. But, you know, the three lines are overcrowded and they're not always running. The loss of mom and pop stores um, and retail establishments uh, it is incredible to see sort of the empty storefronts along Columbus Avenue and Amsterdam Avenue. Real estate rent um, across the board in New York City is becoming really difficult for people who aren't locked into long-term leases or they don't own their own building. Talking to some people in the district, they're definitely concerned about the influx of foreign cash that's driving up their ability to rent apartments or purchase apartments. I think for people in the housing projects, their issues are sort of the standard issues that you hear in every other district. So the quality of housing, quality of schools, um, there tends to be a little more crime in those sort of pocketed sections. to really make sure that they're representing the entire district, not just the voters, not just the wealthy people, not just the corporate interests, which are, you know, the whole Lincoln Center complex of the Met, and, um, the theater complexes and the jazz and Juilliard and everything else. Little things like that, I think, make a, a huge difference. Keeping up the legal protections to keep people here and keeping a stock of low and middle income housing for the non-wealthy to keep this neighborhood as, as diverse as possible and as artistic as possible um, is central to its character, to its, to its, its well-being.
Joining us now is Assemblywoman Linda Rosenthal. Did I say that last name properly? This is Rosenthal. Rosenthal. Okay, I'm going to have to practice that. Okay. Like you told me you're going to practice your Spanish yes. a little bit too? Yes. Okay, so welcome to Race to Represent. I'm, oh. I'm so glad to talk to you today. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. And and this is, you know, this is a, just a conversation for our viewers to, to prepare for these elections. And I want to start with uh, knowing uh, what are three of your biggest uh, frustrations and what are your three biggest accomplishments oh my goodness that's a big question it's right? a big question my three biggest frustrations well I believe that many of my frustrations will disappear starting in January when the New York State Senate um, becomes Democratic controlled versus uh, IDC plus Republican controlled which meant that so many of our urgent bills did not pass so that's uh, one frustration that will go away um, another frustration is um, there are so many inequities in society and especially these days under Trump that um, we have a lot more to do in New York State to protect New York State's residents. As we see that you can't trust what will happen on, happen on the federal level, so we have to make sure that our residents here in the state are protected. So the fact that things are happening faster than we can um, pass laws to protect people, for example, immigration, um, abortion rights, uh, all sorts of issues. So that's another one. Um, one that I sometimes feel as um, a woman is that men are listened to better than women in general. And in government, you know, People have egos, people have ambitions, and you really have to jostle and, and contend to have your voice heard, but that is double hard for women. And so I, I see we're progressing, and uh, the Assembly has elected you know, many more women, and the Senate is about to get more women, so that there will be equality um, and equity in um, our, in our government. And so, you know, talking about that equity, um, let's, let's talk also about the budget. You know, mm -hmm. New York State has a $168 billion mm -hmm. uh, budget. What uh, issues do you think in your district uh, mm -hmm. need to get more funded? Mm -hmm. Well, we have a, a, a large number of runaway and homeless youth from all over the country who come to New York City because uh, we are basically an accepting city and people of you know, all gender expressions, people with lots of different experiences in their formative years, believe that when they come to New York City, they can live more freely and be who they are. The trouble is there are so many people, and, and maybe half of the people who are uh, runaway and homeless youth are LGBT. And so they have their own set of issues that need to be addressed. So there needs to be a lot more funding, and this is this, not just the city, but across the state a lot more funding to help them, uh, to get them shelter, uh, permanent housing, jobs, counseling. There are a lot of needs, especially for that, for that segment. That's, that's one thing. Um, I'm chair of the Committee on Alcoholism and Drug Abuse, and uh, the drug epidemic is not ending anytime soon, and we need a lot more attention to that issue across the state. The main goal initially is to stop people from dying, and with the advent of fentanyl, lacing heroin, so that people say, you know, you're not using heroin, you're using fentanyl with a little bit of heroin. And fentanyl is deadly. So we need to get naloxone, which can o reverse an overdose, everywhere. We also need more doctors and nurse practitioners who can prescribe suboxone, which is a drug that people who use heroin can use to stop the craving and um, limit the, the high. It, it works in your brain to stop that. And many, many people have successfully transitioned from using heroin and having horrible, miserable lives to using Suboxone or Methadone to resume a normal life. So there, there, is, there are only a certain number of doctors who are eligible to prescribe it. So we have to expand that pool. 
Um, we also need more, you know, support services for people who are ready to um, try to deal with their with their uh, substance use disorder. So those are a couple of things. Of course, we need more money for the schools. Um, the campaign for fiscal equity, which uh, the plaintiffs won, uh, we still have not committed all of the money that was promised in in the suit to the city schools. And every school is owed a lot of money, and that will help to make sure that everyone who is entitled to a, a basic sound education or sound basic education, which is every child in New York, has the potential to receive that. But right now, that's not the case. So you've talked about your frustrations mm -hmm. at this, the budget. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about your biggest accomplishments uh -huh. in all these years? Okay, well, um, certainly one of them is most recently. Um, I've uh, been leading the charge for menstrual equity in New York State, which means that uh, there is we remove the shame and the stigma uh, on girls and women having their periods. And, you know, it's a, it's a subject that still is very touchy, uh, that a lot of people don't want to deal with. They don't want to hear the words. They don't want to deal with it. So I started in 2016 by repealing the tampon tax. So for years and years, women and girls have had to pay uh, a tax on tampons as if it were a luxury product which it's absolutely not, it's medical necessity. So my staff and I were going through the list of what is tax exempt. And we saw things like fruit roll-ups were tax exempt, but menstrual hygiene products were not. And that infuriated me, it infuriated you know, everyone I told. So I did pass that law in 2016, and I'm part of the effort to get that law passed in every state because there's still about 36 states where that is, you know, taxes charged, including California, which passed the similar bill but was vetoed by the governor. And that's because the thought that, you know, adding money to the budget should be on the backs of those who need menstrual hygiene products is outdated and outlandish. That's why we need more women in government to present that side of things. So that's, uh, that's one thing that I'm, I'm very proud of. Um, I have passed a number of uh, laws protecting tenants, and that is one of my biggest goals for next year. Um, I'm the sponsor of the bill uh, repealing vacancy decontrol, which is the single largest cause of tenants losing their apartments, um, of harassment by landlords, um, of the loss of tens of thousands of apartments over the years. So, so that's the holy grail bill that, that we're intent on um, passing next year uh, when we do the rent laws. I've also done a lot of work on animals, um, domestic violence, uh, children, education. I mean, I've passed maybe more than 80 laws. So it's, a, it's, a, it's across a, a range of issues. And sometimes I, I forget that I did it. I'm like, that's great <laughs> law. And I'm like, oh, that was mine. Right. So, you know, I, I, I participate fully in the legislative process because I think that's what my constituents uh, demand. I, I, my, one of my first laws was um, orders of protection for companion animals. And that is when someone is uh, being abused or in danger of being abused by their spouse, their partner, um, often the animal is the one that's abused first. And the connection between abuse of animals and abuse of people is a direct one that in 2006 people were scoffing and saying, you know, that has no relevance. Law journals, practitioners, courts, DAs, women advocates say first people start abusing animals, the next step is abusing humans. And it's a it's a warning system, and so I think since 2006, the you know the the understanding of this very complex issue <clears throat> has matured, and so we need to do more, obviously, to protect. It's mostly women, sometimes men. Protect the people who are in those dire circumstances, and protect the animals um, who deserve life 
a good life themselves, but they are also like the, the canary in the coal mine in terms of signaling that someone is abusive and will harm or kill their partner. So you mentioned something very interesting, uh, and uh, it's not a secret that uh, New York City has a lot of uh, housing problems. Yes. Uh, there are 63,000 uh, homeless people in yes. the city. Uh, yes. What would you do to help this, uh, this mm -hmm. 63,000 people, uh -huh. but uh -huh. also how would you uh, improve uh, affordable housing? Mm -hmm. hey, that's a uh, that's very complicated um, problem in this city and in across the state as well. Um, first of all, we, we as a city have been paying I don't know how many millions of dollars over the years to house people in um, SROs in where the original SRO tenants were kicked out. Uh, the people who manage those buildings um, get paid maybe 3,000 plus a month for a tiny room. Um, it's a racket all the way through. I think the city needs to see some of those buildings that are, that are run in, uh, by these operators who know that they can make a profit on the backs of, of the homeless that the city has an obligation, a legal obligation to house. So look in those cases where, where a building is decrepit, conditions are horrible, and see if the city can take over some of those buildings. There are some really criminal actors in that field. Um, we have to have more supports for people. A lot of people who are out on the streets are people who they used up their credit cards because of health problems, bankruptcy, the rent's too high. Um, I mean, it's all interconnected, but help these people get back on their feet. We did have a plan that, um, you know, after under Bloomberg uh, was cut, that, um, that helped people save money while they worked so they could afford to pay for their apartments on their own. That was stopped so they couldn't afford to pay for the rents anymore. So we need programs like that, but we need to build more affordable housing for sure. And there have been so many gimmicks and giveaways for 21A, J51, where developers you know, sign on the dotted line that they're going to offer affordable housing, but often that doesn't happen. But nobody checks. You know, there's no government agency that says, wait a minute, you removed all these apartments from rent regulation, but that was part of the agreement. We really have to take the profit motive. The city has to, you know, the city has a lot of land. Right. Can, can, can build affordable housing on that land. Can you tell us a little bit about the vacant city control, a little yes. bit more specific, what's happening with this bill and, uh -huh. and what else can you do to, to improve this? Okay, so um, I believe this started in 1997. Uh, vacancy decontrol in general means that at, after an apartment hits a certain rent, um, it can be removed from the rent regulation system and become a market rate apartment, which means whatever the market will bear. So in some areas, uh, apartments that are not under rent regulation can they charge $10,000 uh, a month here on the Upper West Side. There's some that are like $15,000. A new building went up and it had a scaffolding and it said, rent starting at $10,000 a month. And I'm like, this is my Upper West Side that I grew up on. Uh, that's how drastically things have changed. But basically, vacancy decontrol means apartments are taking out of the rent regulation system so that ordinary, regular people uh, who have jobs and uh, are not high-powered, you, know, um, you know, leaders of banking and, and other industries can afford, people like you and me. And over the years, there have been more and more laws that chip away at the rights of tenants. For example, MCIs, you know, you get a new roof, each tenant pays 1 60th of the cost, you know, depending on how many rooms they have. But once they have stopped paying, once the roof has been paid for, they continue paying that, and that becomes part of the rent. So there are all these little ways that the rent inches up. And um, with vacancy decontrol repeal, it would mean that people people's units stay in the system. They have protections and guarantees. For example, market rate tenants have no right to a new lease. So if they complain to the landlord there's not enough heat or there's no hot water or, or things like that, the landlord can say, get out after this one year, you're a complainer. So uh, it, 
even though they pay a lot, it, it takes rights away from them. Um, that's one of the reasons we want to keep people in rent regulation, which means that they will get increases depending on the economy every year or two years, but they will be manageable and predictable. So the past few years, there's been a 0% increase for one year, 2% uh, around there for two year. In the past, it's, it's been higher and it may climb higher, but it's a predictable, manageable increase and um, it confers rights on tenants. And it allows people of average income to stay in New York City. And, and, and some of these tenants are over 60 years old mm -hmm. and, and in your district. Mm -hmm. and, and they have sometimes to leave their apartments and oh, move absolutely. out of Manhattan. Absolutely. What would you do to help them and, and mm -hmm. to stay in their homes? Mm -hmm. Well, right now, and this is the answer that I get, this is about rent control, which is different than rent stabilization. Rent control was started years and years ago, and um, the rent gets increased by a complex formula that no one really understands anymore, but it, it ends up being about 7.5%. Um, it gets increased. This is mostly, the vast majority are seniors who live in rent-controlled apartments, and uh, nothing else in life goes up. You know, Social Security has barely increased, their pensions don't go up, you know. They can't continue to live there. There's SCREE, Senior Citizen Rent Increase Exemption, which um, oh, for years has been low. We just increased it to 50,000 a couple of years ago. So if you make uh, through your savings and other uh, pensions, up to 50000 you can get your rent frozen if a third of your income goes to rent, more than a third. The thing is, it's, it's not enough with rents increasing so much and seniors not being able to afford to pay their rent. Those who make 51000 they're out of luck, and we have a lot of those. Um, and they're at $3,000 a month. These are 80-year-old people. They also get a fuel pass along, which means that they have to shoulder the burden of the cost of fuel. It's an outrage. So I have a bill to change that and to have the way rent control tenants' rents go up is through the same system as rent stabilized. And it would be the average of five years of rent stabilization rate increase. So that would provide some relief for the seniors. But we have to look at what kind of city are we? Do we really care about people who've built neighborhoods, who've been here since it was uh, crime-ridden neighborhoods like mine was years ago? You know, you couldn't walk on Amsterdam Avenue or Columbus years mm -hmm. ago. Now you can't walk there because it's too much money <laughs> um, to even peer in those stores that are occupied and, you know, it's very expensive. And New York is clearly becoming a city of very, very wealthy or increasingly empty luxury apartment buildings that people use as their savings account. Um, you know, people from other countries deposit their, their wealth in New York City um, real estate. So there's no housing for the regular person. There are empty apartments because they're not meant as uh, places people want to want to live. They just want to buy and have have stock in New York City. So it's very complex, but we have to make a priority: housing people who are homeless, helping them get off their feet. It's 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 criminal that that people are living like that. Uh, and and you know our last question is something very personal. I love dogs. Yeah. And I, I know you do too. Yes. And I, can you tell us a little bit about the No Pets uh, Left Behind uh, law? Okay. There, there, was a, there was a case in, in Brooklyn where a family was, was going to be evicted. I, I don't recall the exact circumstances, but the marshal was at the door. So they went to purchase, I don't know, some groceries or something. And in that interim, the marshal came and locked them out you're evicted. Their dog was inside. But once the marshal puts that tape on, you can't go back in. And so the dog was left inside for a few days with no water, nowhere to relieve themselves, no food. And there was the, the family had to go to court to order that uh, they op the landlord open the door and they can fetch, get their animal. 
I mean, that's just, it's just cruel and use, un, no need for that. So I passed a law that said that um, anyone who's being evicted, the marshal or the sheriff or whatever, it's a statewide law, has to check if there's a, a living being inside the apartment, and then they have to connect um, with a, um, you know, a shelter, also try to connect with the, the family, and reunite them so that no one, no animal has to suffer, no family has to go through uh, the anxiety of having to leave their animal behind and worrying so much about them. So, so it's a common sense law, but it, it seems that dealing with situations like that are not built into the system. And so that's why we had to pass a law to make sure that no pet was left behind when a family was unfortunately evicted. That's great, and I, you know, I, I love my dog. And, yes. And I, and I don't want anything to And your to dog loves here. you. Of course. <laughs> and I know our viewers love you too, and oh, thank you for being thank here. Thank you. Thank you for, uh, for your time, and good luck with everything. Thank you. I appreciate it. But I think the, because it's predominantly Hispanic population, I guess they nicknamed it El Barrio, you know, as a, as a term of endearment. It's a mixture of different ethnicities. It's predominantly Hispanic. A lot of Afro-American, a lot of Asian, Chinese people from the Middle East moving in as well. And it's been a multi-racial, multicultural neighborhood. issues around uh, deep poverty, around lack of educational opportunity. And one of the things we began picking up was, in addition to couldn't afford the rent, couldn't afford transportation. We're actually, in large measure, not being able to get to a job, look for a new job. We also recognize that it, it really starts to confine you to one neighborhood. The major issue today that I see in East Harlem is the lack of low-income housing, co-ops, condominiums being built up. So they have to put like a certain amount for senior citizens, low income, and the majority is of market rates. The entire population in East Harlem can't fit into those criteria. And we're seeing a lot of diversity of people moving in, but it's young middle class. While there's a lot of gentrification going on with middle class people having more money moving in, we still have, even in my complex, people who may be 10, 50 people living to an apartment because they're doing the things that immigrants did at, at the turn of the last century. One of the biggest problems that Roosevelt Islanders have is commutation. Our community uh, has a tramway uh, and it has a train. Our train is hugely overcrowded, bringing an additional 7,000 people into the community, you can just imagine what impacts this is going to have on commutation. Roosevelt Islanders can't swim into Manhattan. I mean, it's just impossible. So in order for us to, um, uh, to get into the city, we have to commute. By not connecting the ferry that's coming to the MTA system, it puts Roosevelt Island in a position where we are a two-fare zone. Make sure that the ferry system becomes a one-fare system, that it's connected to the MTA. Stop building the shelter, stop putting the money in there. That's just a band-aid, that's just a temporary fix. Start building the infrastructure for people so that it can go on from one generation to the next.
Joining us now is uh, my tocayo, the way we call it in Spanish, State Senator Jose Serrano. Welcome to Race to Represent. Thank you. Uh, thank you for coming. And uh, I want to start a conversation talking about uh, you were first elected uh, to the city council in 2001 mm -hmm. uh, before being elected as State Senator in 2004, right? Yes, that's correct. What are your biggest uh, frustrations and your biggest accomplishments? Well, you know, it, it seems like a while back when I was first elected. Um, uh, it was right after 9-11, uh, elected to the city council. And, um, y you know, I understood uh, early on that the wheels of democracy turn slowly at times. And um, from a frustration point of view, there's oftentimes that we see things. We see injustice. We see things that we wish that we can change. But through the legislative process, of course, and that is a, is a, is a longer uh, process, and it's a good process, and, and, and a robust democracy, you have uh, transparency, you have the community involved in all levels of government. Um, so I understood that, that there was going to be a lot of processes in place, and I was very excited about that. Um, but yet and still, I was you know, frustrated at the, the loss of affordable housing, at the rate that we were losing it. Uh, I was concerned about the uh, conditions of our parks and green spaces, and what what would that mean to the health and vitality of our children? Um, we talk a lot about, or we know a lot about health disparities in the Latino and African American community, and how do we combat that? You know, through uh, better parks and, and recreational activities, but also quality education and having schools that have the facilities that they need to properly educate our kids. So my frustrations did not end in frustration. They just were a motivational tool uh, and why I understood that uh, being an elected official was more than a title, that it was an opportunity to affect change. Uh, and I became very inspired by the leaders who came before me uh, in the Latino community, but in all walks, uh, people who stood for social justice. Um, so uh, I really didn't spend, to, to sort of ramble and answer your question, I apologize, but um, I really didn't spend a lot of time feeling frustrated, but I did feel very motivated and inspired in knowing that there was so much work in front of us and that we need to roll up our sleeves and get going. And all this work is related because you have in your district a very diverse uh, community. Yeah. How do you deal with this? There are so many different needs uh, in the different parts of your district. Well, you know, you touched on it. The district uh, geographically is one of the most diverse um, it covers the South and West Bronx, Roosevelt Island, East Harlem, Yorkville, all of Central Park and the Upper West Side of Manhattan. So you're looking at a district that is easily the most diverse uh, socially, ethnically, racially, economically. Um, there are a lot of commonalities. I feel far more in common than what separates all these districts. But you're right. We have some that are very affluent economically, some that are uh, trying to get uh, their feet on the ground and others that are in great need of help and government intervention can play a tremendous role in helping. Um, I've always believed that uh, when you speak with one voice and you're very sincere and, and passionate about the issues, you say the same thing in every community that you go to and you actually get a lot of inspiration from listening to all of the feedback that you get. Uh, whether you're on the Upper West Side or in the South Bronx, we all care about affordable housing. We care about quality schools and public safety. So there's so many common threads throughout all of these districts that it really, to me, feels very cohesive. And you just mentioned some of the issues, but uh, but can you can you tell us three uh, the top three issues of 2018 that you think uh, are important to address here? Well, I think that in a place like New York City, um, we cannot overlook the need for affordable housing, affordable in, in perpetuity, meaning that we uh, create affordability that doesn't sunset quickly, that allows families, uh, much like we saw decades ago with the Michelama program, where there was housing that was uh, built in New York City for working class families to give them the opportunity to feel secure in their home while being able to make a better life for their children and for the next generation. Um, we've lost Michelama, and there's no 2.0, unfortunately. So what we see is a widening gap uh, in affordability, where you have uh, tremendous amounts of luxury housing for the very affluent, 
And then you have a NYCHA system which is totally broken, which is underserving the constituents who rightly deserve quality housing. And that gulf is something that needs to be uh, bridged. That divide is something that is uh, very unfortunate and very damaging, I think, to the fabric of our society. You know, New York City um, is one that is prized for its diversity. Uh, it's prized for its cultural and artistic uh, stamp that it, it's uh, and, and the message that it sends to the rest of the world. Um, how do we maintain that if we don't have a society and communities where people can live together and afford to be here with their creativity, with all the knowledge that they bring? Um, so I think it's very important that we focus on that. Um, uh, the other uh, thing that I like to talk about is the arts and culture, and I think that this is something that is very overlooked. A lot of times colleagues or others in government will say, well, you know, that sounds nice if we can have it, but it's really not ranking up there with some of the more pressing issues. And I say, wait, uh, when you consider that New York City's economy is driven so much on the arts and culture, people want to be here because of that, that level of diversity in the arts and culture that makes it such a good place to live and raise a family. If you look at it at that way, you realize that it is a pillar. Um, and when I look at the arts as an educational tool, a way to transform people's lives and communities, to give them a way out of poverty, um, I have seen firsthand how the arts have that transformative effect. Um, so that's why I believe that arts education is something that should be mandated in schools. Um, it, it brings about better academic outcomes for students. It gives them the opportunity to do better in their other subjects. Um, another issue I'm very passionate about is environmental justice. Um, again, something that sometimes gets pushed to the back burners uh, because we believe there are so many pressing issues. But locally, um, it's important to know that if we don't have a safe environment for our children especially, um, you, you will see uh, so many chronic illnesses and health disparities and things that we shouldn't be dealing with. Um, and I worry about the use of pesticides and herbicides in parks. I worry if these things are necessary or the, the aerial spraying for mosquitoes every summer. I get very concerned when that happens and I see notices of that, of that happening and I think, why do we need to do this? Um, so I think these are all issues that should be examined and closely monitored and scrutinized to ensure that from a public health perspective, we're doing the things that we need to do to um, have an environment that is clean and safe. And I would like to go back to the art to music education. And so can you explain us a little bit of what are you doing in, in this specific uh, mm -hmm. topic and, and what are the plans to improve it? Well, two things. Um, the arts, as I mentioned, the arts and education, we there are already laws or, or, or um, criteria on the books for a minimal arts education in the state of New York. Unfortunately, oftentimes we're not reaching those goals. Uh, schools, um, you know, the education system I, seems very preoccupied with high stakes testing. Um, and when that happens, some subjects, I believe, get pushed to the side in the arts and music. Um, uh, I believe that uh, that has happened. Um, but I have legislation in the state Senate uh, that would create an audit to get a, a quantifiable measurement of the amount of arts and music instruction. Are we reaching the goals that we've set for ourselves and the mandates that we've set for ourselves? Like I said earlier, the academic outcomes uh, for our students are so closely tied uh, to arts and music education in the classroom. So I feel that with this legislation, we'll be able to show where the areas of improvement are. And the legislation would also mandate that where there are deficiencies, they would have to create a plan of action to reach the goals. The other thing that I, I have legislatively is uh, cultural districts uh, legislation. This would um, allow for the state of New York to assist uh, cultural districts in any community. So any uh, area throughout New York State that whether they have an artistic enclave, um, other cultural venues, that they can sort of coordinate efforts together with the state of New York to achieve the technical assistance, to learn about grants, to learn about ways to develop and nurture cultural districts in their communities. I have seen through research of my own and looking at other statistics that uh, cultural enclaves, cultural sector in communities has been 
uh, has created economic activity in neighborhoods that were otherwise economically depressed. You start to see economic growth. You start to see better housing. You start to see improvement in local schools and other small businesses. So I think that the, the cultural district's legislation can be an economic catalyst. So, um, you know, part of the, the good thing of New York City is uh, of why people come to the city is uh, because of their stores and, mm -hmm. and that attracts a lot of people. Mm -hmm. But we see a lot of stores closing. There are empty spaces all over the city. Uh, do you have any idea what's happening or how could you do something for well, to help this? I have seen this. This has become a big issue in areas throughout my district on the Upper West Side. A lot of the small mom and pop stores that provide um, a lot of, you know, decades worth of service to a community, uh, convenience for community members on Roosevelt Island as well. You're starting to see uh, empty storefronts in many areas throughout the district. Um, and you ask yourself, why is this happening? Um, in a place like New York City, which is so consumer driven, you would think that small businesses would do well. But I think there are so many overriding factors that are making it very difficult for small businesses to, to remain doing what they do. Uh, high rents, uh, commercial rents, and uh, things of that nature are problematic. Um, you know, some of the chain stores uh, uh, take away a lot of the business. I think that the city council has been working on solutions. I, I've, I, I have seen some activity on their part in trying to find ways to help small businesses, but I think in many ways they are the lifeblood of communities um, in neighborhoods like where I live um, in the South Bronx, you know, the small businesses, the bodegas, uh, they are the ones that provide the services that we need on a day to day basis. 90% of the people that are um, arrested or they have to present in court are uh, either African American or Latino. And, and I would like to, to bring this topic to the table about uh, criminal justice reform. Mm -hmm. What do you think, where do you stand on this topic? Well, uh, criminal justice reform is, is one of the biggest priorities of the state legislature and we've been working on it for many, many years. And I remember when I was first elected to the state senate, uh, we were working very hard on Rockefeller drug law reform. Uh, we learned very quickly that the so-called war on drugs uh, was actually not achieving its set goals, which was to reduce the amount of people who were using and buying and selling drugs. And what it was doing was creating a punitive uh, situation where we were arresting and incarcerating uh, so many people who happened to be from the Latino and African American community, much higher rates than other communities who had similar amounts of of drug use, but uh, there was a, di a disparity, a dis disproportionately negative effect on our community. And that has put in, in place, I think, a cycle, uh, a very negative cycle that has taken us decades to come out from. But in general terms, I think um, raising the age of accountability is very important. Um, also creating opportunities within communities uh, to find new paths, new ways. You know, I talked a bit about the arts and culture. You know, the arts and, and, and education in general are the antidote for so much of what ills our society. It has to be a holistic approach. I don't think there is a one silver bullet to uh, remedy the issue about of mass incarceration of Latinos and African Americans and people of color. But the way that we achieve it, I believe, is by looking at all the factors. There are some main glaring ones, of course. Um, with criminal justice reform, but also putting things in place that are just tremendous alternatives um, and uh, giving judges discretion, I believe, to sort of deal with, with the juveniles um, and give them a better path that doesn't involve becoming hardened criminals, I think is a major step forward. And we've seen some changes, Rikers mm -hmm. Island, um, mm -hmm. also uh, attorney, uh, Manhattan's attorney general uh, changed the, the rule and now they're not arresting um, people that are uh, right. smoking marijuana. But what do you think about uh, marijuana? Do you think it uh, should be legalized statewide? Well, you know, I think that it, it, it should be. I don't think that criminalization has done anything in the right direction. I don't think that it, it has done much to curb its use. Uh, if anything, it's just created a, you know, a criminalization that shouldn't be there. Um, you know, the criminal justice system should be um, 
not for people with low-level offenses or people who, uh, in this case, use marijuana. So I think that it would it would create a, a seismic shift, if you will, in uh, in this sort of mass incarceration of people from Latino African American community. And in talking about the Latino community, I think it's really important to know uh, what do you think about the situation uh, with the immigration that's happening right now within the community? Well, you know, immigration is uh, an issue that I care very deeply about. I'm the sponsor of the legislation called the Liberty Act, uh, which would allow uh, for state agencies here in New York State uh, to ensure that they don't inquire about immigration status whenever there's interaction between uh, someone from the immigrant community and state officials. Um, what I have found in places like East Harlem and the South Bronx, where we have um, a history of uh, immigrant community, a strong, robust immigrant community, is that oftentimes the immigrant community will, will stay in the shadows, will not come forward when they've been the victims of crime or abuse, uh, domestic violence, for fear that maybe if their uh, documentation is not completely in order, they'll expose themselves. This bill would ensure that uh, there is no repercussions for coming forward when you've been legitimately uh, the, the victim of crime. But also, I think there needs to be a change in the discussion about immigration. You know, this country was founded on immigrants. Immigration has been the lifeblood of the United States. It is indeed the American dream. People come here from all over uh, to seek a better life, to choose a better life, uh, to be able to um, do, create better opportunities for themselves and for their children. And it's an inalienable right that they have this. Yet, we've seen under, with, with the, the rhetoric coming out of Washington and, other, uh, and others, um, just sort of slamming the door on immigration as to say that the, we don't want these people here. But yet, their forefathers and foremothers came from another place to be here, and that's fine. And, all immigrant groups at one time or another faced uh, hostility, faced challenges, um, and our community now is no different. But I think that if we send this chilling message to other countries and to our neighbors and saying, we don't want you here, we're in effect being very anti-American because we, what makes America, the experiment of America, such a compelling and wonderful thing is that we sought to choose and to invi invite <clears throat> the greatest and the, the smartest and the hardest working everyday people from other countries to come here and build a new nation and build a better nation. Uh, and we, the minute we turn our back on that, uh, we in many ways are turning our back on the American dream. Uh, I have two topics, there are two important topics that I want to bring to the table, jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, like someone on uh, international level says jobs, jobs, jobs. Mm -hmm. What's happening with jobs in, in your district <laughs> and housing? Mm -hmm. So can you t give us a little bit of uh, a sense of what's happening in your district with these two topics? Well, jobs is always a challenge. Uh, there is always a need for more jobs. You have a growing community. Um, but I believe we need better, better jobs, better paying jobs, jobs in fields that can provide for a long career. Uh, we've seen in the Bronx, we've seen a major turnaround. Uh, and I give a lot of credit to our borough president, uh, Ruben Diaz, Jr., uh, for working very hard and making a, a cornerstone of his work to bring new jobs to the Bronx. And we've seen uh, a, a lot of growth and increase in that regard. And in other parts of my district, you know, I have Manhattan and the Bronx, and in Manhattan, uh, we've seen a growth of employment in places like East Harlem and in other, and in other parts of the district. Um, but again, it, is, it, it goes hand in hand with education. It goes hand in hand with opportunity. Um, and, and I believe that you know, there was a time, you know, going back decades, where New York City was a manufacturing town, where the bread and butter of its, manuf of its jobs were in areas like manufacturing. Um, we've long since passed that. We are no longer that city. So we have to develop the new areas um, that allow us to remain at the forefront of employment, of gainful employment. I believe that technology is uh, always a growing uh, factor, health care. Um, there are so many ways. Um, I mentioned the arts and culture as being an economic catalyst. These are all areas where um, economic activity uh, are here for New Yorkers. We just need to try to make connections to allow people uh, from the South Bronx, from in East Harlem, 
to be part of that uh, economic growth because it's useless if we have economic growth for some but not for others. The other point you mentioned was housing. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning of, of our segment, housing is always so important, especially affordable housing, um, because the vast majority of New Yorkers are working class, are the ones who create the foundation of our economy. They are the ones working in the service industries. They're working in our schools. They're working in our healthcare industries. They are the ones that keep these trains running on time. Um, and if we're not provi providing stable housing that allows for continuity in communities, we destroy our economic base. So affordable housing, I believe, is not just important for the tenants, but it's important for the economic well-being of our city because employers will not have an, employ an employment base of which to draw on if we don't have skilled uh, uh, workers in the five boroughs of New York City who can afford to live here and raise their families here. And, and you have a great example of, of working hard, right? Your, your father was, uh, has mm -hmm. been a congressman since 1990. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us a little bit about like, what have you learned from him? Well, my dad uh, has been in public office, I believe, 44 years now. He was in the state assembly uh, from the 1970s and then has been in Congress, as you mentioned, since 1990. Um, and he has always been a reformer. He, has, he was elected during that period after Watergate where there was a groundswell of reform, of re activism uh, within the political establishment and he ran as a reformer uh, in the Bronx and has always stayed true uh, to his beliefs. And I, in my 17th year in public office, um, have always looked at him as a, as a good example, as someone who's remained true to his beliefs of doing what's right for the community. Um, one of the things that is most important to the work that I do is constituent services. I mentioned this really vast district that I have, but I only have one district office. Uh, so what I do is I do uh, constituent hours in different places throughout the district every day. Um, uh, in the Bronx, on Roosevelt Island, on the Upper West Side, I bring mobile office hours to senior centers, to libraries, and we, we promote this on social media so that people can come. And similar to what they would do if they were in our office, bringing to us concerns about housing, about employment, about education, and my staff is there on site to do the intake there. And uh, I, I believe that that is, is what is so important. I'm not you know, the first to do a press conference. I'm, I'm not that type of an elected official, not that there's anything wrong with it. I believe wholeheartedly that my bread and butter as an elected official is constituent work. Just hearing from constituents one-on-one, -on -one, knowing exactly what they're dealing with, how the, the, the issues change over time, what are the main concerns that they're bringing us, how can we be out in front of these issues. Um, I think that is the job that we were elected to do. So I feel very excited, very passionate about this opportunity. Um, and I, I'm very grateful to, to you for giving the voters and the people uh, in the community the opportunity to hear from elected officials and hold us accountable uh, to our issues and concerns. And I am really <laughs> grateful that you came here. So thank you very much, you. Senator, and good luck. Thank you. Thank you for watching. Please remember to vote. The general election is on Tuesday, November 6th. For more information on all candidates, visit our website, racetorepresent.com, or the League of Women Voters website, lwvny.org. Thank you for watching Race to Represent on Manhattan Neighborhood Network. Goodbye.